Dr. Belkin, who's going to introduce our next amazing speaker. We're so fortunate to have both of you on at this moment. Okay, great. So yeah, these are great talks. And this next one, nutrition and MS is so relevant and so important. It's something we get questions about every day. So I'm certainly excited as well to hear it. So Dr. Alana Katzand, um, she received her undergraduate degree from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, where she was elected to the Beta Gamma Cigna Honor Society. She obtained her medical degree for the Columbia University of Physicians and Surgeons, where she was elected to the AOA Honor Society, the Arnold P. Gold Humanism in Medicine Honor Society, and received the Helen Sciera Prize in Neurology. She completed her neurology residency at Columbia University Medical Center, where she was elected chief resident in her final year and was recognized by the Arnold P. Gold Humanism Foundation Circle of Excellence in Teaching. She then pursued a two-year fellowship in multiple sclerosis at the Corinne Goldsmith Dickinson Center for MS at Mount Sinai, funded by the Sylvia Lowry Fellowship Training Grant from the National MS Society. She joined the faculty at Mount Sinai following the completion of her fellowship in 2013. Dr. Kat Sand is currently the Associate Director of the CGD Center for MS. She cares for patients with multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, and other neuroimmunological conditions. She received a Coleman Family Award for Excellence in Physician Communication in 2016 and 2022. She is heavily involved in research and is currently the principal, principal investigator on several studies at the center with a focus on clinical and translational research and a particular interest in how environmental factors, especially diet, affect prognosis. Recent and current studies include a pilot clinical trial of a dietary intervention for MS, observational studies related to diet and other lifestyle factors in MS, an investigation of the role of the gut microbiome in MS, a study on the mechanisms of neuronal degeneration and progressive MS, and a pilot clinical trial of cetirizine as an add-on for neuromyelitis optica. Her work has been funded by the National MS Society, the U.S. Department of Defense, and the Guffey Jackson Charitable Foundation. She is a member of the National MS Society's Wellness Research Working Group and co-director of the CGD Center's MS Wellness Program. So certainly here is Dr. Alana Kassane. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me today. It's really exciting to be here. Um, and I'll start by saying that um, as I try to pull up my screen here, um, it was really uh, fun for me to see that video of Stacey Hirsch just now. Um, so Stacey actually volunteered in our center last summer and we tried to get her some uh, research experience and we're, we're very excited that she is interested in, in either going in going into medicine or something in, in healthcare and and wanting to uh, move the field forward in MS. So I'm really excited to be talking to you about nutrition for MS today. So just as an overview in terms of what we'll talk about today, um, we'll first talk about why we're talking about this in the first place. We'll think a little bit about some mechanisms by which we think diet might be important. Then we'll get into what I would consider the most common things that people ask me about. So some of the different dietary components and, and whether those have a role in MS and then some of the patterns. And then we'll get into some of our uh, current recommendations and, and kind of where, where things are going. So the first question is why are we interested in diet? And I think there's two main reasons for this. One is that people who live with MS are asking us about this. So this is one of the first things I noticed when I started um, taking care of people with MS, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 years ago, was that everyone was asking us this question, you know, what, uh, what can I do? What kind of diet should I eat? And we just were saying, you know, we just don't know. And that was not, that was not a satisfying answer. Um, as a clinician, it's not satisfying for me, and it's certainly not satisfying for the people who are living with MS in terms of what to do. Um, I think people are interested in this because this is something that everyone can do to be really proactive about uh, about living with MS. And I think it's really appealing that this is a, a natural approach, which I recommend as something to complement traditional disease modifying therapies. The other big reason is that we have increasing scientific rationale. So at this point, we know that there's a very strong environmental component to MS, which we'll talk about in a moment. And at the same time, there's a lot of variability in outcomes. So we know that if we have two people who start you know, diagnosed with MS at the same time and put them on the same medicine, one of them might do really great and the other one might really struggle. And so it's on us to try to continue to search for what are those modifiable factors? What are things that we can do that are going to make people's prognosis better? 
And I think diet is a really good place to look. We have good research at this point linking medical comorbidities, so things like diabetes, hypertension, that are related to diet, of course, with MS outcome. And then we have some preclinical research, which means you know animal models and things in, in, in test tubes and stuff in the lab, which have shown us there's some really good ideas out there in terms of mechanisms by which this might be important. And we'll talk about these in a moment in terms of dietary metabolites. And, and um, we just heard Dr. Wawan give a fantastic talk about the gut microbiota. And then we have some observational studies and some early clinical trials that I'll tell you about. So this slide relates to a lot of the topics that we're talking about today. Um, so we think about the etiology of MS in terms of what what pushes people into this diagnosis, but then we also need to really be thinking about, okay, well, beyond that, someone is diagnosed with MS, what are the factors associated with the outcome? And there's actually quite a bit of overlap, especially in terms of the environment. And with both of these, we know that there is a genetic predisposition, um, both in terms of developing MS, the etiology, as well as in terms of severity, but it's, it's relatively small. And really what it seems to be big is the environment. And there are a few factors that we know about. We you know, talked a bunch about EBV, for example, um, and some other factors, but there's a huge chunk that's really not explained. And so we need to be looking at some other things. And I think that's where diet comes in. So let's think for a moment, how, how could this actually be? How could diet have an effect in MS? I think there's two big categories to think about. One is indirect effects mediated by these comorbidities. So things that, that we know to be associated with worse outcomes in MS, we have good research establishing these, these things now. So having um, a high body weight, having a cholesterol levels that have an, ad, having an adverse profile. So having a high LDL, uh, cholesterol, for example, is associated with having more MRI lesions and having greater MS-related disability. And then other vascular risk factors, having high blood pressure, having diabetes, especially when they're not well-managed, um, are associated with worse outcomes. And of course, all of these things are tied indirectly to diet. But then I think the part that's even more interesting is thinking about what are the effects that are actually directly related to diet? So what about direct effects of the foods that we actually ingest? And then there are effects that are mediated through the gut microbiota. So you heard Dr. Wabant say that diet is one of the factors that affect the microbial composition, meaning which bugs are actually there in, in the intestines. Um, and depending on which bugs we have, that has an influence on that mucosal immunity that's there in the gut. And that has an influence distantly, including in the brain and the spinal cord. Um, things that we ingest also induce the gut microbiota, whatever bacteria are there to produce different metabolites. And those again, diffuse into the circulation and get all the way into the brain and the spinal cord. So I think we need to think about foods the same way that we think about the medications. Um, and we think about medications, you know, pharmacologic um, interventions as these chemical structures. And we think about how they bind to certain receptors on certain cells. And I think we really, we need to be thinking about foods in the same way. So foods have different molecular components, um, which have different structures, and they bind differently to different cells and, um, you know, trigger those cells to behave in different ways, depending on what we eat. And that leads to this slide, which I put here as a reference, because um, I think this is a great paper. I know people were asking about, um, uh, you know, resources and things like that. This is a very academic paper. But uh, it gives a nice schematic here of this idea of a gut-brain axis and the communication between the brain and the gut and how that happens. And diet is a big part of that. Okay, so now we'll get into some of the evidence for dietary components in MS. And I know we're a little off time, so I'm going to try to go through um, some of the stuff a bit quickly. I'm always happy to talk offline if people you know, have further questions and, and we'll, we'll take some time for questions at the end. But what I wanted to include here was some of the components that I feel uh, my patients ask me about the most frequently, the things that come up the most frequently. There are certainly other things that we could talk about. And honestly, we could talk about the rest of this topic for you know three hours. Um, but for today, I'll just kind of go through each one. And there are references here on the bottom in case you'd like to go back to any of the primary um, manuscripts where, where these relationships were described. So dairy is one of the things people ask me about a lot. Um, you know, is, is dairy okay? 
Um, some people think dairy is inflammatory. Some people think it's bad for general health. Some people think it's bad particularly for MS. Um, most of the things we're gonna talk about today have not been really well studied and have not been studied in an interventional way. But so what I'll, the data, the data that I'll show you is really observational. Um, so there was an, an older study that looked at T cell reactivity. So cells you know, in our immune system, which are highly important in MS. Um, and they showed that T cell reactivity as an MS patient showed these very high responses to, to milk antigens. And in particular, one of the proteins in milk, so people also ask about the facts in, in milk and whether, okay, maybe whole milk is not good, but maybe skim milk is okay. But one of the points made is that perhaps it's actually not the fats and maybe it's one of the proteins. So um, the milk protein butyrophilin has actually been implicated as possibly inflammatory in MS because there's this um, thing that's called antigenic mimicry, which just means that people think that that protein actually looks similar enough to myelin so that the immune system maybe is being revved up um, against myelin inappropriately. There's also the idea that um, it's inflammatory in terms of the um, changes that it causes to the microbiome. Again, we don't have a clinical trial um, that really shows us an answer to this. So, you know, I think what we have is, is kind of mixed. And if you look at registry studies that, you know, when you ask people how much dairy they eat and you look at their level of disability and stuff, it's really been quite inconclusive. So I, I don't think we have great evidence for this at this point. One of the topics that also comes up a lot is um, fats, and we'll talk about some of the different kinds of fats out there and how those play into foods. So um, when we talk about classifying fats, we think about saturated fats, where the, and that's called a saturated fat because the chain, the carbon chain for the fatty acids is saturated with hydrogen atoms versus polyunsaturated fats or monounsaturated fats where the fatty acid chain does have some one for monounsaturated or some for polyunsaturated double bonds. And of particular interest for MS, people have thought a lot about um, omega-3 fatty acids. So that's one of the polyunsaturated fats. So what evidence do we have? So in terms of clinical studies, um, people have looked a little bit at saturated fat. I'm sure uh, a lot of people are familiar with Dr. Roy Swank and his studies. So Dr. Swank really was quite a pioneer in, in studying diet and MS. He was looking at this before anyone thought it was a hot topic. And um, the research that he did, I think, was really impressive for the length of time that it went on. Unfortunately, the way the study was designed was really before the modern era of clinical research. So um, there are a lot of biases introduced there and make it pretty hard to interpret the results or to take them rigorously because he didn't, for example, randomly assign people to the two groups. He just kind of told everyone, eat this diet. It's a very low saturated fat diet. Um, and then he followed people to see what happened. And so people kind of self-selected. He called the people who followed the diet good dieters and the people who didn't bad dieters. And he found um, significant differences. First of all, he found that the people who followed the dietary recommendations lived longer, which is not surprising in terms of what we know, things like heart disease and stroke. Um, but um, he also found that the people who followed the diet well uh, were much less likely to be severely disabled in terms of their MS um, at the end of the very lengthy follow-up period compared to people who did not follow the diet well. Um, there was also a, a prospective pediatric cohort study actually led by Dr. Walbant. Um, you know, we, we mentioned earlier in terms of the pediatric cohorts that she follows. Uh, and so in this study, they had 219 children that were followed for an average of about two years. And what they found in that study was for every 10% increase in energy intake from saturated fat, the risk of having an MS relapse was increased three times. So that's huge. Um, it's, it's, it's really quite large. Again, this is observation, but it's, it's quite a large relationship. In terms of polyunsaturated fats, um, these are fats that are found in things like fish, walnuts, flax seeds, and in animal models, polyunsaturated fats seem to have important effects on uh, immunomodulation, neuroprotection, also remyelination and repair. But then when we get into clinical studies, um, we haven't really, we haven't had any clinical trials specifically looking at PUFAs. There have been some observational studies 
But again, the results have been kind of conflicting. So there was one study, the nurse's health study, which suggested a link between MS, uh, the incidence of MS, so whether or not you develop MS, and the intake of uh, a particular PUFA. But then some other studies have showed a link between intake of fish and omega-3 fatty acids, but not clearly uh, the ALA that was shown in the nurse's health study. So again, I think we have some conflicting results and, and supplements. I think the trials have just really been too small to, to conclude anything. Fruits and vegetables, I think, is an important category to think about. Definitely something I, I highly recommend um, for my patients to, to watch. Um, we think that fruits and vegetables are helpful through a few different mechanisms in MS. One is they are high in fiber. And we talked a bit before about the gut microbiota and how the gut microbiota produce different metabolites depending on what gets put in. And so when you put in fiber, that induces the gut microbiota to produce these short chain fatty acids. And we know that short chain fatty acids, we think they're of high benefit. Uh, they're very anti-inflammatory, for example, and they help uh, T cells grow up to be more regulatory uh, anti-inflammatory T cells. We also think they're important because of the flavonoid content. So that's, you know, the flavonoids are the pigments that give fruits and vegetables their bright colors. And we think that those uh, flavonoids have important effects on, again, on Im immunomodulation as well as on neuroprotection and repair, at least in animal models. There's a very nice example of some work that was done by um, some of our colleagues in the past few years, which showed that tryptophan, which is derived from the diet. Um, specifically, they were thinking about um, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower. Um, it actually can be broken down into metabolites that can get across the blood-brain barrier and have important effects, effects inside the brain. So the fact that they were able to actually show that something was going from the diet to the gut, to the bloodstream, across, and then they were able to demonstrate an effect on, on important cells in the brain, I think is really, it's just such interesting work and so, it's so important for us in terms of thinking about the ability of diet to have effects in people with MS. Going back to Dr. Wambon's um, cohort in their pediatric study, they found that a one cup equivalent increase in vegetable intake decreased the risk of relapse by 50%. So for people who are familiar with some of the um, medication trials in MS, a lot of the medications that we're really excited about decrease the risk of relapse by 50%. This is not a clinical trial, it's an observational study, but still, when you think about the numbers, it's pretty impressive. Um, there was also another registry-based study that found a link between a higher intake of fruits and vegetables and uh, patient-reported disability and disease activity. I think this is one that most people, a recommendation that most people can get behind, even if we don't have clinical trial evidence. Grains and gluten is something that people ask about all the time, and it's actually one of the areas where we have the least evidence in MS. Um, the studies that have been done have been really small and just not really well designed. Interestingly, um, NARCOM, a NARCOM study, which was done by my colleague, Dr. Fitzgerald uh, at Hopkins, People may be familiar with NARCOMS as a huge um, MS registry, uh, which is a wonderful research resource. And thank you to any of you who, who participate in it. Um, there was actually an association between higher intake of whole grains and a lower level of MS-related disability. One of the things that might be important is, you know, grains that are high in fiber, so um, whole grains. We think that that um, that they may be beneficial. Again, coming back to the short chain fatty acid production idea from the microbiota. Salt is something that all has gotten a lot of attention in the last few years because of some research that had come out. So we know that having a high salt intake induces the development of some of these pro-inflammatory T cells. So the T cells that um, grow up in the gut and can differentiate into different types of T cells are more likely to become pro-inflammatory T cells if they're raised in a high salt environment. And we see this in animal studies. There was a study done by some of my colleagues in Argentina um, that looked clinically, and again, this is observational, it's not a clinical trial, but they looked at 70 people with relapsing MS and they stratified them by their sodium intake. Those who had a medium or a high level of salt intake over two years had a higher relapse rate and a higher number of new T2 lesions on MRI. 
However, there have been some additional studies that just haven't confirmed this from an observational standpoint. So um, Dr. Wamon's study, they looked at um, their cases of pediatric MS patients compared to those who didn't have MS. They tried to use a food frequency questionnaire to estimate um, sodium in the diet. They didn't find a link. And then, um, you know, looking at people with established MS, again, pediatric study followed for almost two years, didn't find any link between the relapse rate and sodium intake by food frequency questionnaire. And then my colleague, Dr. Fitzgerald, again, looked at the benefit trial data. Um, this was an older study that uh, was a trial for interferon, um, but they had banked urine samples. And so they were able to estimate the salt in the diet by looking at the urine samples. They had over 400 patients in that trial. <laughs> they were followed for quite a long time and they didn't find any link between salt and clinical relapses or MRI. So that's a big question mark. <clears throat> okay. So let's look now at some of the different patterns and I'm sure um, people have different experiences with these. So there are a lot of different MS diets that are popular. The questions are, the questions that I get are, well, I see all these different diets out there they're all different from each other, which one is the right one? And then what's, I, the question I ask back is, well, what's the evidence? Okay, so let's go through some patterns. So first is just thinking about overall um, quality of the diet. And um, this slide has some information. And again, I put these here so that pe if people are interested, they can go back and look at these papers. But the punchline here is really just that there are two separate registry studies that showed a clear association between overall quality of the diet, which is established by using a dietary screener and assigning points for different items. The overall quality of the diet does seem to be linked to MS-related disability. And this is all self-reported scores, but um, I think very interesting and important nonetheless. So some of the patterns that people have been looking at, we talked briefly about the Swank diet. Um, other patterns people are looking at are modified paleolithic diet, or also known as the Walls Protocol, uh, McDougall diet, which is a plant-based, very low-fat diet, um, caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, ketogenic diet, uh, ketogenic diet and then um, our group has been studying a Mediterranean or mine-type diet. We'll just go very briefly through each of these. Basically, what I'll tell you is that for each one of these diets, um, my colleagues have done a great job moving the field forward. Um, but all of these studies are kind of small and pilot size. And hopefully over time, we're gonna be able to do larger, more rigorous trials to really learn. Um, but what we've got so far is a li little bit of evidence. So first, um, I'll just tell you briefly about uh, Walt, the Walls, people you know this as the Walls diet and the WAVES trial. Um, this was looking at a Swank diet versus the Walls diet. Um, the Walls diet people I'm sure are familiar with is a paleolithic elimination diet, which includes meat, fish, certain vegetables and fruits, but eliminates entirely gluten, casein, and lectins. And in this study, there were 87 participants who had significant fatigue at the beginning who were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion. They were followed for 24 weeks and, um, and they, did very, they did very well. Um, people had significant reductions in fatigue when following this dietary pattern. Uh, the McDougall diet uh, is based on the intake of starchy plant-based foods. Um, only 10% of energy intake is from fats. There's no animal products at all or oils allowed in this diet. My colleague, Dr. Yadav um, at OHSU did a, led a study where they randomly assigned 61 people with MS to follow this diet or to be a weightless control for a year. The primary endpoint in the study was looking at MRI and they did not meet that endpoint and they didn't find a difference in clinical relapse rate. But honestly, the study was really too small to be able to tell those things. I'm sure people who are familiar with MS clinical trials will know that we enter hundreds or thousands you know, patients into those studies. So this study was really quite small to be able to look at those things. What they did find was that this diet significantly reduced fatigue. And so that, that was very exciting. As we know, fatigue is a huge, huge issue in, in, in people living with MS. And so this led them to design a larger study, um, which is completely focused on fatigue, looking at this diet, which they're doing now. 
caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, very hot topics, not only in MS, but in the, you know, um, general health world too. So there are a couple different ways that people can do this. Um, we know that chronic calorie restriction is a benefit in animal models, but that's not really, I think, a reasonable thing for people to do all the time. Um, what people have really looked at is this, you know, idea of intermittent fasting or a fasting mimicking diet. The idea is to try to get benefits of fasting without having to fast all the time. Um, and we can see from animal models that there are beneficial effects on immune modulation, um, protection of oligodendrocytes, and promotion of repair. Um, an initial study in people with MS showed that um, people were actually able to follow these patterns. It was a pretty small and short study, um, but it seemed like people were able to do this. It was pretty well tolerated. They lost a little bit of weight and they had improved emotional well-being. So we'll see where that goes. Ketogenic diet is another pattern people are interested in. The idea behind a ketogenic diet is to shift metabolism. So um, the idea is to use fatty acids as the primary energy, so energy source. And that leads to production of something called ketone bodies, which lead to a decrease in pro-inflammatory cytokines, the way that the immune system communicates. We know that ketogenic diet seems to be of benefit in animal models in MS. And uh, there was recently, uh, there actually were uh, one study and then a follow-up study done. The newer one was an open label study. So everyone knew they were getting the ketogenic diet, which is you know the way it has to be. Um, but it was a single arm study without a control group. But it showed that the ketogenic diet was pretty well tolerated, associated with some weight loss and improved body composition. And um, again, helped with fatigue, also helped with depression, and seemed to at least stabilize, maybe actually improve even a little bit MS-related disability over at least, at least in the short term. So now I'll actually spend a few minutes telling you a little bit about why um, our group has focused on uh, Mediterranean-style diets, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've published recently. So. The reasons we've been interested in this type of diet are, are several. First is there are very well-established general health benefits for this type of pattern. There is great data in cognitive aging. So we know that Mediterranean style diets are helpful in terms of prevention of uh, development of dementia or slowing of dementia. And when you think about MS and neurodegeneration in MS, it's different than that in Alzheimer's, but there are a lot of similarities actually. And so we thought that was a helpful starting point. Um, this pattern combines the limited information that I told you about in terms of components that we do have. It, it, I think that this pattern kind of encompasses all of those things. We also feel that it's reasonable to aim for long-term adherence. So this is really a lifestyle change rather than a diet. It can be very friendly for, um, for the household budget. And because it's something that's really good for general health, it's something that everyone in the house can do. So it's not, you know, something where it's like you're the, you're the person who has MS and you're going to be the only one in your house eating this way. This is something that the whole house can do. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the evidence that we have in MS. So this was a pilot study that we ran a few years ago where we randomly assigned uh, 18 patients with MS to follow this diet and 18 to participate as a control group. And mostly we were thinking about feasibility. So the study was gonna be run for, run for six months and we really asked people for a big commitment. We were worried about whether um, people would volunteer and how the participation would go. But I'm very pleased to say that the recruitment effort went great. Um, everyone who participated did a fantastic job in the study. Um, what we found was that the people who were on the intervention part of the study lost a small amount of weight, about one pound a month, even though we didn't ask them to lose weight and we didn't counsel them on calories. It was just from improvement, I think, in terms of the foods that they were eating. Um, and we found benefits in the intervention group compared to the non-intervention group, again, in terms of MS-related fatigue, the impact of MS symptoms on daily life by a, a common questionnaire that's used often in MS, as well as on their disability score. So we were really excited about this. The next thing we said is, okay, now we need to work on some more background evidence uh, to show us that really this is the right path. And so we started thinking about, well, how can we, how can we get that kind of evidence with, to help us build a large clinical trial? So we said, okay, we gotta do some observational studies. 
So next we wanted to look at imaging and I'll tell you how we moved into that. Um, but we thought about different patterns. Um, we like the, what's called the MIND pattern, which is Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay. It was initially developed by colleagues at Rush University um, for people with Alzheimer's and in cognitive aging. And the MIND diet, um, you know, when you're, when you're assessing someone's diet and you want to assign a score, you give a score of zero to 15 and people get points for different things. So here you can see in blue that there's a score that's based on, you know, quote, healthy things we think they're going to be healthy for the brain. And then in pink, the things we think are going to be unhealthy for the brain. And so everyone gets a score. Um, we, our, our idea, our hypothesis was that there, we think there's a benefit to this diet in terms of neurodegeneration and MS, in addition to the immunomodulatory benefit. This is what we wanted to study. So the first thing we did was we have a cohort of um, people who volunteered to be part of research when they were within their first few years of MS diagnosis. And we have 185 people in this cohort. Um, we are now in year six of follow-up of this cohort and we're learning just so much from it. Um, but this paper that we published was based on the baseline data when people first enrolled in the study. And we looked at, we had them all fill out a food frequency questionnaire so we could understand their diet. And we assigned everyone a score a mind score between zero and 15. And then we looked at the volume of their thalamus, which is a deep structure, which is actually um, the first structure in the brain in MS that gets affected. And so even though people were in their 30s and only two years on average from the time that they were diagnosed, what we found was a link between their mind diet score and the volume of their thalamus. So the more someone's diet aligned with the Mediterranean pattern, the better their thalamic volume was. And thalamic volume is linked to all kinds of things later in the disease course in terms of brain volumes in the rest, in the rest of the brain, as well as um, clinical disability. So this was pretty exciting for us. The next thing we did was we wanted to look clinically to see um, in terms of like physical issues and cognitive issues and to see whether those were related to diet. We couldn't do that at, the, at that point in, in terms of the first cohort that I just showed you with MRIs because those were people who were only really two years from diagnosis. And fortunately, they really didn't have a lot of physical or cognitive issues. They had some people had some, but it wasn't enough to be able to study something like diet at the baseline. We'll be able to do that over time. So what we did was we looked at our cohort of people with MS who've come through our comprehensive annual assessment program. We have a program at our center that we encourage everyone to come through. And it involves um, a set of assessments every year. Um, and it's all kinds of stuff, language and memory testing and physical testing, um, questionnaires. And what we found was a, a very nice relationship between the Mediterranean diet score, we used the screener, and the MSFC, the multiple sclerosis functional composite, which looks at, um, people will be familiar with a nine hole peg test, how fast you can put pegs in a dish, a time 25 foot walk, how fast you can walk 25 feet, and the symbol digit modalities test, which is a, a quick cognitive test. And we found this relationship after we controlled for all of these demographic and health-related uh, variables. So we controlled for age and sex, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, um, body mass index, uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity level, sleep, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, and smoking. And after we controlled for all those factors, there was still a relationship with Mediterranean diet score. So we thought that was pretty interesting. Similarly, we found a relationship between this score and all of the patient reported outcomes or PROs that we administered. So we asked people questions about their fatigue and their MS symptoms and their walking and their cognition and depression. And we found they were they were all seemed to be related to people's dietary habits. Okay, so where do we go from here? We're going toward bigger clinical trials and we're all trying really hard uh, you know, the biggest barrier is really is really funding, but we're we're working hard to move this field forward. So the question at the end of, of this is where are we now? What can we recommend right now for people living with MS? So I'm very fortunate to be part of a fantastic group of people at the National MS Society's uh, Wellness Research Working Group, and we have a nutrition subcommittee. And all of the studies that I just showed you um, are people who are really interested in diet and MS, and um, and we all work together and meet every month. And so there are some recommendations that we all agreed upon. And these 
these are the tenants right here and you can they're posted at the National MS Society website. But the things we all thought we can agree on now and that we recommend to our patients are as much as you're able to try to prepare meals at home, um, incorporate colorful fresh fruits and vegetables every day. If you do choose to eat grains, you should try to choose whole grains over refined grains. And, and really my biggest recommendation to my patients is to try to avoid or limit processed foods and added sugars as much as possible. In terms of getting started, these are just a few of my, of my clinical recommendations. The first is to think about your goals. What do you wanna do in the short term? What do you wanna do in the long term? Another is to include your household in your plans. So, you know, I mentioned before, the thing I love about Mediterranean patterns is it's something that everyone in the house can do. It's not like you're making one meal for yourself and then, you know, another meal for everyone else in your house. This is something that everyone should be able to get on board for. On board with, it's healthy for everyone. And the more you're able to do that, the easier you make it for yourself, the more likely it is that you actually are gonna be able to do the things you set out to do. Um, another recommendation is that you should aim to make some positive changes that are really gonna be just incorporated into your lifestyle. It shouldn't be a diet. A diet is something like, you know, our parents did for a few months when they went on Jenny Craig or, you know, whatever else they did, but it was not, not sustainable. The idea is to just make some changes that you think can just become part of the way that you eat instead of looking for, you know, a, a diet. Practice makes progress. So it's not going to be perfect. Um, and it, it, it does get easier over time. Asking for help, I think is really important. So you can talk to your primary care doctor about this. You can try to arrange a visit with a dietitian. I think if that's accessible for you, it's a wonderful thing to do, but it can be hard. There are some insurances that will reimburse dietitian visits. Not all of them do, um, but if it's something you're able to do, I think it's great. You can also ask at your MS center if there's a staff member who's able to counsel people about diet. So I am of course very comfortable with this. This is my area of research. I'm always happy to counsel my patients. Not everyone, not every physician is gonna feel comfortable with it, but there might be someone else in the practice who is, there may be a nurse practitioner who has an interest in this. Um, or there may be just, you know, someone else, in the, someone else in the practice who has an interest in this who might be able to work with you. And the last thing, the most important thing is to be kind to yourself. So this is not something to be anxious about or to feel badly about. The idea is just to make a little bit of progress here and there so that over time you get yourself into as healthy of a pattern as possible. Um, I'll finish by just telling you that we are very fortunate at our center to have developed, um, I co-direct this patient wellness program with my nurse practitioner, Gretchen Matthewson, who's wonderful. And we have a fantastic team of people we work with. So we're very lucky to have this patient wellness program. Um, our biggest issue is not having enough resources to be able to run it in the way we'd like to, to be able to serve everybody, um, but we're trying. And we're hoping that over time, if we're able to show over time through research that this program is effective, we're hoping to be able to get insurance reimbursement for it and to be something that's accessible to everyone who lives with MS. So just to conclude, um, we have strong scientific rationale for our interest in the role of diet. We have limited evidence at this point for a role for particular factors and patterns on outcomes. Um, general principles of healthy eating we think are reasonable to recommend now. And with that, I will thank all of the wonderful um, people that I work with, the MS Society for funding our work, all of my patients and their families for putting up with our constant requests for participation and research. Um, and there's, you, get to, you guys get to see my crew at home of, of little helpers. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation and your helpers are gorgeous. Thank you. I don't know how you got the freedom there. <laughs> I do. There is there is quite a bit of noise on the other side of the wall. I hope you guys are not doing <laughs> We got a few questions, and I know we're running over. I sorry, Doctor Bowen. Sorry. <laughs> um. So let's see here. Is there any research that explores how DMTs themselves might interrupt the body's ability to absorb and utilize nutrients that actually help with MS? Thanks for your presentation. That's a great question. Um, no, um, there has not been any research specifically looking at that. Um, I would not expect disease modifying therapies to interfere with the way bo the body absorbs nutrients. Um, 
the little bit of work that we've seen so far seems to suggest that the disease modifying therapies seem to push the gut microbiota in a healthier direction. Mm. Um, it, it's very little bit of research that's been done so far. So um, my guess is if anything, um, the disease modifying therapies that we have seem to be making positive changes on the peripheral immune system that, that may actually make it easier uh, for, for a diet um, to be effective. That's my guess, but that's a guess. I think you kind of answered this, but your opinion on a plant-based diet for MS. Yeah, um, I think a plant-based diet, you know, is, is great for general health. Um, I definitely recommend something that's mostly plant-based. Um, people have different preferences in terms of whether they eat meat at all. And I think we don't have enough evidence to say for certain you know, all meat is bad, for example. Um, I did present some data on saturated fats, for example, which mostly come from animal products. Um, so we do have some links there, but I think the data are not definitive enough to say, you know, oh, definitely this is the way to go. But I think it's a good thing to do. It's very good, certainly very good for general health. It's good for the environment. It's, you know, so I, I do like a, a plant-based diet. Does the high use of pesticides, i.e. glyphosate, affect MS? It's a great question. Um, we don't know that for certain because it's a very hard thing to study, as you can imagine. Um, you know, there's been a little bit of work looking at pesticides and like in animal models and, you know, basic science research, but it, it would be very hard to design a clinical study to look at that. As you can imagine, people have all kinds of different exposures. Um, I do recommend, I think for everybody, but I do recommend to my patients that when you're able to buy products that are organic and local, if you're able to, if that works in your budget, and a lot of this you can do best by if you have like farmer's markets in your neighborhood and things like that, I do think it's better to try to avoid these pesticides. I think they're not good for us. Um, Definitely everyone should be properly washing their produce before consuming them. Um, it's, it's more of an issue for uh, produce that don't have thick, don't have thick skins uh, where you're not, you know, when you're peeling something and throwing that and then you're eating the, you know, the fruit that's or the vegetable that's inside, I think it's probably not as big of an issue. Um, but I think in general, pesticides are not good for, are not good for our health the same way that so many things that we're exposed to every day, air pollution, um, plastic containers, you know, all, all these different things I think are not good for us. Um, whether they're specifically bad for MS, we just don't know, but I would guess they probably are. What is your thought on parasitic infestations within the body as a cause of MS or activator of MS symptoms? Parasitic infections. We haven't found any evidence for um, parasitic infections. Parasites are, are interesting. People actually have started have studied a little bit um, the idea of actually purposefully um, giving someone a parasite to try to help with MS, just because <clears throat> certain parasites actually can induce a state of immune tolerance in the gut. And so um, there are some people who think that this like a helminth that we should actually be looking at these um, to try to help promote immune tolerance in MS. But there hasn't been uh, anything that I can think of, um, any data that I've seen to show particular, I don't know if there was a particular parasite that someone had in mind, but um, parasitic infections are also just not that common, you know, in, um, in the United States, for example, maybe, you know, more common in other places in the world, but mostly in places where they have a lot less MS than we have here. What is the registry mentioned that I could join to be included in dietary studies? Ah, so that's a good question. There are, are actually so many different ways um, to be involved. Um, the registry I was mentioning was the NARCOMS, NARCOMS registry, um, which is, uh, you know, run by, by CMSC. Um, but there are many other studies that, you know, people can sign up and volunteer for um, if you want to be involved. Yeah, there's MSPATH, there's, there's, all, different, there's all different ones. 
I would definitely encourage, um, you know, speaking to your speaking to your physician about it, and they could recommend one that's local to you or one that you could sign up for online. But thank you for volunteering. Thank you. I think there's uh, some other specific questions. Maybe I could email you, and then we could get sure. the answers back to them. And yeah, those. Sure. great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Thank you. Your gorgeous helpers behind you. Thank you. Thank them for letting us have you for a brief portion of your day. I will. I will. They were pretty good. <laughs> Thanks. Namaste. Guys. This is such an important topic that does get so many questions.